Good evening. I'm Dr. Ann Coscarelli, and we're going to get started in just a couple of minutes, but we're going to show a short video that shares a little bit of information about the Sims Man Center. We're going to start with that, and then we're going to do a couple of introductions and announcements, and then we'll get on to Dr. Glaspie. We're also live streaming this for the first time, and so we welcome our live stream audience, and um, uh, just be aware of that when you answer or when you ask your questions. Okay, let's uh, run the video. upside down. Just weeks after moving to California to attend graduate school, Lindsay was diagnosed with a rare form of pancreatic cancer. It was, it was hard. I didn't know anybody else. I didn't really know that young adults could get cancer. I think the first thing is shock and a patient has sort of the world closes in on them when they first hear that they are that they are facing a cancer diagnosis. One out of every three women and one out of every two men will be diagnosed with cancer during their lifetime. However, almost everyone will be touched by cancer. The Sims Man Center is incredibly important, not just to our patients, but to their families and loved ones. Uh, cancer is a disease with a huge human component to it. And what the center does is provide the cement that holds everything we're doing together. The Sims Man Center offers highly specialized professional services, including counseling and psychiatric care, individualized support groups, meditation techniques, art therapy, and Qigong. The value of this center is that it's instrumental to patients getting through their cancer treatment. The concept behind the center is that medicine is not enough, that the patients really are looking to other help besides getting surgery, chemo, and radiation. Not only must we provide accurate diagnosis, the right chemotherapy, the right surgeries, the right radiation oncology, but we need to optimize their wellness. You don't want to go through cancer alone. Uh, our Sims Man Center makes sure that that doesn't happen. I think the ability to care for a patient's psychosocial needs is as critical as providing for them and their physical needs. And without that added support and the time uh, and resources that are provided to the patient through the Sims Man Center, I would be only half a doctor. The patient would be only receiving half their care. And who wants to crack eggs? Me! Yeah? Oh. Breast cancer patient Tina received help from a specially trained Sims Man psychologist. She was the one who was able to help me um, develop a a script, if you will, when I did go to speak to my daughter about what was happening to me and what I was going to look like. I think one of the things that we really try to assist patients with is to gain a, a sense of mastery over the experiences that they're about to have. My, my baby came to me and she said, uh, Mommy, are you going to lose your hair? And I said, No, Valentina, I'm not going to let that happen. I'm going to shave my head. This kind of empowerment that I felt um, through my therapy, through my group, through my everything, I just really started to feel it. And that's when the, the warrior started to come out. The Sims Man Center has been an invaluable uh, part of my life because it's, it's changed the way that I'm able to live my daily life. It's as if the Sims Man Center helped me rewind and then relive those parts of my life and be able to reach becoming a 23-year-old as opposed to being still an 11-year-old 
in some areas. We really rely on the uh, professional man center who rotate through our clinic daily to help with the emotional aspects of the disease. I have colorectal cancer that's also metastasizing to my liver and my lungs. So I'm a terminal cancer patient. And so my need at the Sims Man is probably the most need that a cancer patient can use because one of my big concerns is, is what happens after. They're looking for all kinds of things. They're often looking just for someone to be a witness to their suffering. Uh, they're looking for someone to be beside them in their journey. I've done some videos and I've made some, some books that, you know, that I can leave behind that'll give my daughter a little, a little inkling of what her dad was like. Put me at ease knowing that I've left something behind for her. My husband's mother died of cancer at age 42. When my father became ill, together Ron and I experienced the difficulty and the confusion in trying to get knowledge and understanding of my father's illness and so that we could make optimal decisions for my father's care. It is through our personal experience that we created this interdisciplinary center to meet the individual needs of the patients. We learned that treating the whole person and their family is critically important. The Sims Man Center offers counseling on nutrition, supplements, and complementary medicine. We are assessing you and helping to integrate everything together to help you to reduce the amount of side effects you're having and to go through this journey as easily as you can. It makes me cry. It's been nothing but wonderful. Not only physical preparation, but a sense that you have some control. Maybe there is something you can do for yourself while you're being done to by your treatments. The Sims Man Center features the Reflections Boutique, where patients can purchase well-researched supplements, receive assistance with prosthetics, wigs, scarves, and hats. That's darling. We think it's really important that we improve quality of life, and that's our primary goal. I like it, yeah, with the ears tucked in. Sims Man offers invaluable information through newsletters, their website, and insight lectures featuring the latest cancer treatment and research. What I learned there and the follow-up afterward resulted in treatment that I believe saved my life. Most of the services at Sims Man are provided without cost. Jim Ellison discovered Sims Man when his wife of 30 years was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. And we used those two years that we had before eventually we lost uh, Shirley, accepting the realities and understanding what we could do with the limited time we had to make sure that no story was untold or no expression unsaid. How could we put a value on that? During that whole two years, it was never a fee. It was never a bill. The Sims Man Center exists by the generous support of donors. I can't imagine a dollar better spent than right here at the center. I've seen firsthand the impact that it's had, not just for my family, but for others as well. It was an easy choice to, uh, one that was embraced by our whole family. Why wouldn't we pay it forward as they had so graciously done to us? The Sims Man Center now offers world-class educational programs to mentor the next generation of holistic cancer healers. It's great to have them as a, an ear that understands what I'm going through. It gives them a place to call home, really, to find um, companionship and support. I can do it with the help of people like the people here at Sam's Man. I've looked ahead and <laughs> the future is mine. Well, I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. This is actually our 253rd lecture, if you can believe that, and that we're in the 22nd year of doing Insights into Cancer. And I'm really happy to be here tonight. For those of you, how many are here for the very first time at an Insights into Cancer lecture? Oh, welcome. 
Um, you have a lot to catch up on, and there's a lot of videos on our website, so if you want to follow up, you can see 200 and some odd lectures. Um, I'm really happy that you guys are all here tonight. I'm happy that we're actually streaming uh, video. As you can see, the center is funded by the support of the Sims Mann Family Foundation, which we're deeply grateful to for their funding. We also have an advisory board, and I know at least one member of the board is here tonight, who make donations on a regular basis and help to support the center. But the center is also funded by people like you who come to the center and have friends and family that want to help support it. And we're really grateful for those donations. I feel really proud that for almost 22 years now, we've been able to offer those services without fees for patients. And that feels like a great accomplishment and we continue to do it until there's no longer um, cancer as a difficulty that, that people have to face. We have some upcoming lectures. On April 21st, we're gonna be hearing about prostate cancer, and that will be with Dr. Robert Ryder. And on May 12th, we're gonna be talking about knowing your options for advanced care planning. And I think that's gonna be an incredibly important lecture with Dr. Neil Wanger and Sean Kravich, who is a, a lawyer uh, from the Cancer Legal Resource Center. And I hope that you'll join us because this is something that affects all of us. We all at some point need to be making plans for how we're going to exit this world and both in terms of our financial planning but also in terms of the choices that we want to make certain apply to us. So I hope you'll join us for that. Um, wherever you are in the phase of life, it's important. And on June 9th, we're gonna be talking about genes and cancer and Dr. Himalowski will be talking to us about the truths and the myths. So we have a number of lectures coming up, and by then we'll actually be starting to plan, if, if you can believe it, we'll be planning the 2016 lecture series, which I find hard to believe. I'm excited about it, though. I'm excited about the fact that we have so many great people here at UCLA who can come and present and, and share this information with all of us. For those of you who may be interested in helping out the center, I just want you to know that it costs about $1,000 per year per patient or family member that we serve. And so that $1,000 goes to provide that care. And we have a one-to-one -one club with that are for people that make donations of that size. One of the things we've also been getting off the ground is what we call our birthday fundraising club or anniversary club. A number of people like to recognize their um, anniversaries of cancer or birthdays or things like that, important celebration time points. And a lot of people feel like they don't have, a, they, they have enough things in their life and they want to give to some sort of charitable organization. We're encouraging people to become part of our birthday club to make the decision that when your birthday rolls around during that month, you'll do fundraising for the center by sending out an email telling your story and asking people if they'll help provide support to the center. We have a page on our website, and I hope you think about doing that. A number of people who have done that have told me that it's been very worthwhile for them. And actually, last year for my birthday, I did it. And a few years ago, I did it for my wedding. And it was really great to actually see how many people responded to it. So I hope that you will, will join in. You heard a little bit about the center. You heard about Carolyn Katzen, our integrative oncology specialist. That's one of the few fee-for-services programs that we have in the center. Um, and if you're interested in that, you can talk to anyone at the center and we'll provide you with information about that. I just want to remind you about a few upcoming groups. So uh, we have our meditation group, which is on Mondays from 1.30 to 3, and our acupressure group, the next one, uh, will be coming up. Um, it's usually the third Monday of every month. And we also have a young adults group um, from 5.30 to 7 p.m. on the first and third Tuesday, as well as a husbands and partners group. So those are some, some upcoming groups and also our circle of reflection with our chaplain, which will be on March 17th. And they're gonna talk about insiders and outsiders. So I hope that you'll join us for one of those groups. You have a handout and in your handout, um, there's a green sheet and that's your place where you get to tell us if you're interested in learning about one of the groups or might be interested in joining and it looks like this and you can fill that out. You also have another sheet in your handout which looks like this. 
This is the form that you can use to communicate with us. So if you would like to receive communications from us, and I wanted to share with you how we use this communication. So this is your way to be on our mailing list. You'll get at least once a month an announcement about the next Insights into Cancer lecture series. You'll get a, a blog wrap up for the month. So it'll be the listing of whatever blogs came out in the month and you can click on any that seem interesting or you can throw it in the garbage can if none seem interesting to you. Um, and towards the end of the year and a couple times throughout the year, we actually ask people to make donations, but we don't on a regular basis send you, we're not like a lot of organizations that send you an email every day about make a donation and here's the story and we don't do that. At the end of the year, we send several at the end of the year. So that's, that's how we use that. We don't sell it to anyone. We don't give it to anybody else at UCLA. And so I just want you to know that. And it's very important that if you want to get these announcements from us to make sure you complete this and get on our, on our mailing list. And the last thing that you have in your handout is I want you to know about this, which is our pink evaluation form. We're always trying to continuously improve the programs that we offer. So we ask you to rate tonight's lecture. And it also is your way to communicate with us about things that you'd like to see coming in the future. And like I said, in about April and May, I start planning the 2016 lecture series. So I look at this very carefully. So this is the other way that you get to communicate with us about the lecture tonight. So I hope that you will um, complete those and hand them in at the end. Now it's actually my real pleasure to get to introduce Dr. John Glasby. He's board certified in internal medicine, hematology, and oncology. He received his MD from the UCLA School of Medicine and his MPH in Health Services Administration from the UCLA School of Public Health. He's a professor of medicine here in the Division of Hematology Oncology at the David Geffen School of Medicine. He is an Associate Chief of the Division of Hematology Oncology in the Department of Medicine and Vice Chair for UCLA's Johnson Comprehensive Cancer Center Scientific Protocol Review Committee. He holds the Estelle Abe and Marjorie Sanders Endowed Chair in Cancer Research. He completed his residency in internal medicine and his fellowship in hematology oncology here at UCLA. I think his blood might be blue and gold, but I'm not sure. Um, during the course of his career, he has authored more than 300 articles, abstracts, book chapters, and conducted numerous studies in a variety of areas, including stem cell transplant diseases, diet, cancer-related anemia and fatigue, ovarian cancer, and melanoma, and he's received numerous awards and honors that I would put you to sleep if I were to read them all to you, so I will not. He's also been named one of the best doctors in America. He has an important role at UCLA. Um, he has a large and active practice and specializes in women's cancers, breast and ovarian, as well as melanoma, and really he's probably one of the most knowledgeable oncologists I think that I've ever met. He also happens to serve on our Founders Board, and he's a really strong advocate for the center in the UCLA health system. So it's been my pleasure, actually, to get to work with him. So would you help me welcome Dr. John Glasby? <laughs> Thank you, Anne. So, um, I'm going to try and do something a little different tonight than we usually do with some of these talks. And although I'm going to do a whirlwind tour of where breast cancer is at in 2015, I'm going to start at the 80,000 foot level and work down because I think uh, uh, that's useful and that some orientation uh, is in order. And because there are general principles of cancer biology that address the human questions you ask. Questions like, why is there cancer? That, that may be uh, uh, an important question. Um, uh, how is cancer linked to the other uh, normal processes we go through in life, especially aging? What's the, what's the interaction there? Um, and why haven't we evolved to where we don't get cancer? What's the, what's, w w why, why are things the way they are? Uh, and, um, uh, and, and in that process, I think, dispel a few myths 
and uh, disorientations in how we look at the cancer problem in general and breast cancer in particular. So point one, uh, which is uh, 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 something that wasn't clear at all until the 1970s and 80s, and that is that cancer isn't a foreign invader. Cancer is, by and large, a hijacking of very normal uh, cellular processes. So uh, uh, this was, this was uh, actually discovered by two individuals who were working on, uh, up, at, up at UCSF, who were working on uh, what was thought to be viruses that cause cancer in chickens. And it turned out it wasn't the virus causing the cancer. The virus was actually tracking a piece of the chicken DNA and inserting it into the next chicken in a place that uh, it, 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 it would lose its regulation and start to be a normal gene making a normal gene product in an abnormal, dysregulated way. That was the birth of the field called oncogenes. Uh, and, uh, now we have a much richer understanding of all of the different parts of, of normal cell biology that are hijacked in cancer. It might help if we put the problem this way. Um, everybody in this room at one time went from being a single cell to being six, seven, eight pounds of human cells in nine months. That is faster than any cancer grows. That uh, process of embryology as we went from a fertilized egg to a baby uh, involved uh, cells migrating and invading and forming uh, new structures, uh, growing at an incredible rate, et cetera. Uh, whenever I cut myself shaving, I turn on a bunch of genes that if they were to get out of control, they would be called oncogenes, but as long as they stay under control, they're just repair genes. They make new skin very quickly so that I don't bleed to death every time I, I shave. Uh, this is uh, a, a relatively recent uh, uh, review by uh, Hanahan and Weinberg that's now talking about all of the different uh, aspects of cancer cells and these turn out to also be, uh, each one of them, hijackings of normal cells. It's normal for us to be able to make new blood vessels. If, uh, if we uh, uh, do that in, in the cancer setting, we call that tumor angiogenesis, but we need to, to have that capacity. Avoiding immune destruction. We can't uh, let our cells be destroyed by our immune systems. And so we have developed abilities to avoid immune destruction on the part of our cells, and those are hijacked, we now know, as I'll show you at the end of the talk, by cancers. For every single one of these aspects of cancer, there is a normal homolog that's absolutely necessary to human biology. So cancer is really uh, a, a, a loss of the regulation in uh, control of cells and an expression of normal cellular attributes in an inappropriate way. And that uh, is, uh, uh, was a very important observation and one of, the reason, one of the reasons that there's been the progress there has been has been this, this, uh, uh, more ma this maturing of our understanding of cancer biology. I'm just gonna take a step back and talk a little bit about uh, uh, non-cancer biology uh, and where cancer fits into this. So uh, many of you in the audience probably are, uh, have accepted the theory of evolution. If you haven't, you can substitute for this that all living things uh, uh, appear to be intelligently designed in a way that optimizes their, their, uh, their reproduction. I don't want to offend anyone, but it's true that, that that pretty much uh, everything in all biology appears to be organized along the lines that 
uh, we're trying to optimize our reproduction and the survival of our offspring. The second, uh, and there's only two, uh, two of these is that we, we, we all live on a budget. The main budget down through evolutionary times has been energy, and we have to allocate our available energy to all of these processes. Uh, we have to replace turning over cells. Uh, while I've been talking to you, I've made several hundred thousand blood cells in just these few minutes. Uh, Anne made a billion during her introduction. Uh, uh, and uh, that, that requires a ton of energy. Uh, I will, on a regular basis, replace the entire lining of my gastrointestinal tract, etc. cetera. Uh, we are constantly having to pump uh, sodium and potassium uh, in cells to uh, keep them where they're supposed to be because they leak. Uh, we're, uh, uh, we're constantly having to find food. In a modern uh, era, this finding food might be the number of hours you spend at work every day. But, but this is energy that has to be expended. Reproduction includes all the mating rituals, and uh, then all of the child rearing uh, that goes on, humans spend a huge amount of their budget on child rearing because our children don't become independent uh, when they're born. They don't even become independent when they're weaned. Many of them don't even become independent when they finish college. <laughs> and so uh, we spend a huge amount of energy on this. Uh, escaping predators is a problem for some organisms, not so much for us anymore. And then we get to this one, repairing a damage to biochemicals. All of the, all of the processes I, ta I talked about are regulated very carefully, and, and, and humans especially are incredibly well designed to, uh, to repair the constant uh, erosion of the of the integrity of our biochemicals. These are the regulators of those processes, and it isn't when you think about this and you you sit and and uh, do this every day. So ama so hard to understand that someone might develop cancer. What's hard to understand is why we all don't develop cancer within a couple of months of being born, given. The, the amount of, of, of damage that's accumulating every day be repaired with great fidelity. Uh, how long we live uh, depends on uh, how well we repair damage. Humans do much better than almost all the other species. You know, mice are dead before they're two years old. They're mammals too. They get old, and uh, when they're, they're a year and a half old, they're getting very old, and they start to get cancers and all the things we get as we're older. They don't put very much of their budget here because they have to put so much of their budget here. We don't. And for a, reason, a lot of reasons, we can afford to spend a lot of our budget here. And then the other factor, the only other factor that we need to have a sort of uh, rudimentary understanding of what's going on here is that our design has in part to do with how likely we are to be killed. So mice, because they're very likely to be killed, uh, after they're born, they become fertile within two months. Their strategy is reproduce before the eagle finds you because it's, it's not going to take long. And they don't need to do nearly as much of this in order to be it doesn't have to be perfect, they just have to have optimized given the cards they were dealt. Uh, um, for us, this is, is much less likely to occur, and so for us, we can have a long lifespan, change our reproductive, to, uh, reproductive strategies, delay that reproduction, because we can put a lot of budget here and live a long time. And that's kind of the structure of how uh, of how nature works, and that's all we need to know to move on with cancer. So when I was in medical school, one of the, 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 the you know, the, these classes have favorite lecturers. There uh, was one of our, uh, the, the man who taught us renal physiology was a guy named Jared Diamond. You may know him by Guns, Germs, and Steel and some of the other 
Collapse, the other books. He's a very uh, uh, thoughtful, broadly read biologist who also was a, a very well-established uh, uh, physiologist, remains uh, one as well. And we were always happy to hear his lectures. If you haven't read it, The Third Chimpanzee is another one of those books. This was one he wrote in the 90s. And uh, when, when the question occurs, the question always used to occur to me, why haven't we evolved to uh, always repair everything? We could be immortal. It certainly would make us have uh, thousands of children. It should be a evolution. It might, in the long run, not not work out well uh, for the world. But for for us, our ability to optimally reproduce, why stop? Why stop when we're we're uh, eighty? Why not just repair all of the damage? And the key here is this word optimize. Um, one of the reasons why we have the cancer problem that we have to deal with, and this is especially true of breast cancer, as I'll show you, uh, and prostate cancer, is that um, the, the name of the game isn't to maximize one of these bullet points, it's to, it's to spread the energy in a way that's optimal across all the things we have to do. And what Dr. Diamond points to is the, uh, the failed British experiment of, uh, the, of the light battleship. They got the bright idea uh, in the years leading up to World War II that they could technically have a battleship that had just as big a guns and just as much firepower that could go uh, much faster than any other surface ship. So they called these cruiser battleships and they were maximizing speed. They took the entire budget of the battleship and put it into speed. That should have made it a dominant battleship. This particular battleship, the Hood, uh, took one shot and sunk because it, they sacrificed all the armor. You, uh, the reason why we don't do a 100% job here is it's too expensive and we can't afford these other things and we don't want to sink like the Hood did. And, and proved to be the biggest flop in naval history, not the biggest success. So down here are two animals. This one uh, is subject to constant predation and isn't going to live a long time, but is relatively closely related to us. This is a mammal. This is a, uh, more distantly related to us, but no way a bird is going to carry this off. These, uh, this organism uh, puts a ton of its energy into repairing ongoing cell damage and lives to be, in some cases, older than we do. This one uh, is lucky if it lives two years and tries to get its reproduction done within the first two months of life. So it's an, it's, they're just an, it's an example of this whole thing at play out there in nature. This isn't an excuse that for... Uh, 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 for cancer, but it's, it's useful to understand something before you try to deal with it. So now let's get back to the cancer problem. There's, uh, as a cancer is developing, uh, there, it, it, de it develops in the setting of damage largely to DNA, sometimes to proteins, but usually to DNA, uh, the, the, the stuff genes are made of, including the genes for regulation of the other genes. And we do an, an, a phenomenally good job of repairing this damage. None of us would be sitting here tonight, the age that we all are, if we weren't uh, in the animal world uh, very, very accomplished at this DNA repair thing. It's not all because we drink from plastic bottles and we lived in the Garden of Eden and there is no uh, problem with aging or, D or DNA damage unless we are exposed to plastics, there are indeed environmental contaminations and carcinogens out there in nature we'll touch on. But even without those, there's a constant background noise of errors being made. And if those go unrepaired, and if we make thousands every day and miss one a week over a period of time, we will pick up a lot of 
of damage in our DNA that's passed from cell to cell and it starts to accumulate. And then you end up with mutations. Now one mutation is not able to cause cancer except for one uh, instance in human oncology and it's not breast cancer. But what happens is some mutations are mu mutator mutations. They make the next cell division much more likely to have a mutation. So it creates instability. And then you have two mutations and sometimes that second mutation is also a mutator mutation. And then you pick up a third and all along the line now, as these uh, mutations are accumulating, this cartoon makes it look like it takes three mutations to get to carcinoma in situ. We know that it really takes uh, many thousands of mutations to get to this stage. And then uh, more and more mutations accumulating in an increasingly unstable uh, uh, tumor env or in, uh, cellular environment, and you're off to the races with cancer. That's how uh, cancer works. This appears to be a very applicable model to the topic tonight, which is breast cancer. So now let's now we're get down to where we can start to recognize things because we're not so so uh, so high uh, in our overview. So if you look at this, uh, there's there's evidence, there's fingerprints of everything I've told you. So uh, cancer. Uh, in both men and women, the most common cancers are cancers of the breast and prostate. These are cancers that are sort of in the overlap area between our decisions to uh, put our money into reproduction and our decisions to, to sell repair. Both of these tissues, prostate and breast cancer, are organs that respond to sex hormones, and that response is a normal uh, proliferation uh, in women on a cyclic basis, but these cells are under constant stimulation to grow and divide. And it's growing and dividing cells that are most likely to make mistakes. Um, it's a price we pay for having uh, uh, sexual reproduction instead of budding like yeast do where this, this you wouldn't have a need for, for uh, target organs for sex steroids. We understand both of these cancers a lot better than we understand other cancers, and we have a lot better treatment strategies for them. And so if we look at deaths, they're not, they're not the most common cause of cancer death in men or women. They, they're between 10 and 14% of cancer deaths because many of them are curable and modern treatments uh, for them are much more effective than they are for diseases like lung cancer. Now, uh, it's not all about, it's not all just about uh, we're born and the human condition means that if we live long enough, we'll get cancer. There actually are big international variations in the incidence of of cancers. This is uh, uh, taken from a, a recent paper reviewing that. And this means per, uh, one of two things. Either there are major genetic differences between populations in different countries that drive cancer rates uh, that, that may be due to differences in how they budget uh, uh, for the different evolutionary tasks for energy. Um, but it also might be due to environment. And the way one might test that uh, is you, go, you find a population that started here and moved here and see what happens to their cancer rates. And that's been done and I'll show you that data. Now, uh, it does matter whether you get health care for cancer when it happens. Uh, and, and what kind of country you're, you're in in terms of healthcare system. Uh, the United States, because most of us, that's what we're interested in, is in the highest cancer incident class of nations, but it's not in the highest cancer death list of nations. It's, it's up there, but it's, it does better than the 
than it than it does in, in its rank ranking uh, for incidents. Canada, for whatever reason, doesn't. Okay. Now, uh, breast cancer. So there's a 21 per 21 percent of cancers in women around the world will be breast cancer. That's about a million cases in the world a year. High risk versus low risk countries is a six fold difference. The rates in some low risk countries are increasing very rapidly, Japan, Singapore, and Korea. Uh, in the past 40 years, their breast cancer incidence has doubled or tripled. And um, uh, uh, a, a larger fraction of breast cancer patients in, uh, in developing countries will die of their disease. So let's put all this together, and then we'll get on with breast cancer treatment. So this is uh, uh, a graph of, of breast cancer incidence with age. So message one, the, the, the biggest message here is that the older a woman becomes, the higher her risk of breast cancer. It's not a surprise given the uh, evolutionary perspective we've taken. Right, that, that uh, accumulated mutations, unrepaired mutations, no matter how good a budget, budgeter you are, you can't become the battleship hood and, re, and repair all of them. So some will, will be there and eventually you will have enough mutator mutations to develop cancer. But within the, this, there are big differences in the incidence of breast cancer in these different populations. They're all behaving as though uh, cancer is a disease, uh, breast cancer is a disease of aging, but there's variations here. And if we look at Japanese women in Japan, here's their curve. When they move to Hawaii, within a generation, here's their curve. They've half closed the gap already within one generation to the white U U.S. They're halfway to getting the U.S. risk. Uh, if they uh, live in San Francisco, they get there quicker. They get there within a generation. And this, this kind of data, this is way too fast for this to be genes. This has to be environment. And there's something about the environment in the United States that it, or in Japan or both that's explaining this uh, uh, this difference. Uh, most people, when they look at this and, and think about it, have focused on uh, the diet, specifically dietary, either total of fat, and I'll show you why that would be in a minute, or the specific quality of fat. These polyunsaturated fatty acids are unique because they have double bonds in a long chain that can be at different places. Uh, two places, the sixth and third positions, are the important ones. And they, because they're different from each other, they carry information and they can uh, change how cells work. Uh, in the United States, our, our biggest uh, dietary uh, polyunsaturated fat, fatty acid is corn oil, which is omega-6. Uh, in uh, Japan, they eat a lot more fish oils, and those are omega-3s. They both end up in our cell membranes, and some of them transduce growth signals much better than others. And you can guess it's the corn oil that makes for a more irritable, responsive cell. There's also perhaps a difference in dietary estrogens, and there may be uh, a difference in, in radiation exposure, although not so much anymore, uh, between the uh, United States and Japan. So what are the risk factors? And then we're going to put all this together and, and, and finish with breast cancer uh, incidence. Early age at menarche or late menopause, the number of years a woman spends cycling uh, is a risk factor for breast cancer. That's not a shock when I told you that that we're talking about cells that are being constantly stimulated. Not having children is another way of getting more cycles into a lifetime. Later age at first birth, same thing. Uh, increased number of births is a protective factor, and that 
is a way to take some cycles out of a woman's life. Uh, a family history of breast cancer, there's clearly a genetic link. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, uh, having breasts that look like they're getting very stimulated on, on mammograms is a risk factor. And so is postmenopausal obesity and uh, alcohol use. So we have to figure out a model that explains all of this plus everything I've just said, and then we can move on. So uh, there's been one giant clue that sort of uh, has fallen into our laps and, and is actually now led to some therapies. And that has to do with uh, a gene that was discovered several years ago, a pair of genes, uh, they got called BRCA1 and BRCA2 because they were thought to be genes that, that conferred breast cancer risk. They do. They also confer ovarian cancer risk and, and uh, at a lower level, risk of some other cancers. Uh, why are mutations in these genes so uh, good at causing, uh, at causing these cancers? These two genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2, are involved in the repair of breaks in DNA. You need these genes to work to repair double-stranded DNA breaks. And uh, there's some other genes that, that are involved in sensing those breaks and helping these uh, molecules do that work, but they both work in that uh, sensing, uh, sig signaling, and repair of double-strand DNA pathway. And their adequate function is essential to repair. These, there's some glue that you can put on there that will repair it and the glue comes off, but you need these intact to, to, to do that. And when they're not present, those DNA, uh, DNA damage does not get repaired. Okay, so um, uh, I don't want to oversimplify. The genetics of, of, uh, of cancer are very complicated. There are a lot of much less powerful genes involved that, uh, that confer various levels of risk and accumulations of several of these more risk. It is surprising, or maybe not so surprising, the, uh, the frequency with which genes that are identified to be associated with breast cancer turn out to be genes that are involved in estrogen response, estrogen production, and estrogen degradation. Estrogen is really at the key, and a, a smart alecky way to say this would be that e whether we're talking about um, environmental or genetic breast cancer, women get breast cancer for the same reasons they get breasts. They have estrogen. Estrogen is at the center of this. Uh, uh, here's some genes that have been associated with breast cancer that have to do with breakdown of estrogen or with, uh, uh, with the impact of estrogen on cells. Okay? Um, now, uh, an experiment got done, and the experiment was the Women's Health Initiative. There, there was, uh, several years ago, uh, a emerging belief that menopause was a disease and it needed to be treated and that if women received estrogen so they didn't have a menopause, their hearts would stop aging and their brains would stop aging. And so the Women's Health Initiative tested that hypothesis. They, they debunked the notion that uh, uh, estrogen is associated with cognitive pr protection in women and, uh, or the prevention of heart disease. But at the same time, they discovered that estrogen, uh, when it's given with progesterone, is clearly associated with an increase in breast cancer risks. So and now the Co Koch's postulates have been fulfilled. Uh, and we have, we have excellent evidence that uh, estrogen is involved in, in breast cancer development, not that it wasn't pretty clear already. Uh, overnight, uh, about half of the women who were taking estrogen stopped after the Women's Health Initiative. So here's a workable synthesis for all this. 
estrogen leads to proliferation in the breast. I don't think anybody uh, doubts that. That proliferation uh, increases the opportunities for mistakes and mutations to happen. And once those happen, there's only two possible outcomes. They either get repaired or they don't. If they don't get repaired, and then more errors occur, and you get that uh, cascade of mutator mutations that we talked about that ultimately leads to cancer. And how do all these other things fit in? Well, uh, dietary fat, lowering exercise, hormone replacement therapy, alcohol intake, uh, late, men late menopause, early menarche, uh, nulliparity, uh, all increase the estrogen exposure on the part of the breast. And uh, uh, that should increase this whole process. Omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids make the breast tissue more responsive to whatever estrogen stimulus is coming down. That's the corn oil business. Uh, there are countervening things that can be done or exist. It is uh, possible that omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids that are much more uh, common in, Jap in the breasts of Japanese women block this, that they quiet breasts down and make them less responsive to estrogen. Or we can do that with drugs using drugs like tamoxifen or raloxifene or the aromatase inhibitors. Those also uh, decrease the amount of estrogen proliferation that's going on. Uh, time is never on our side and, and uh, time and age uh, act to increase the, the accumulation of this process. Uh, and radiation therapy, radiation exposure. For instance, have uh, have a increased incidence of breast cancer because when you're in an airplane, for the time you're in the air, you lose the protection of the atmosphere from from uh, radiation from outer space. And it's one thing if you go to New York a couple times a year. It's another thing if you're in the air uh, for, for a job. Now, um, uh, here's another uh, useful bit of information that whether it's something you would want to do or not, if, if you were offered it, it does teach us something about breast cancer. Uh, the, we, we can identify women who, are, who have a significant risk of developing breast cancer, and there have been randomized trials done where half of them received a placebo and half of them received an estrogen-blocking drug and these trials have, have shown with tamoxifen shown here and with an aromatase inhibitor, which is something that just lowers estrogen levels in postmenopausal women shown here, the chances of developing breast cancer, at least during the first several years, uh, goes down. So now we have more evidence that estrogen is, is sort of a central key uh, in, in breast cancer. Um, Tamoxifen has some side effects. One of them is that it increases blood clot risk in postmenopausal women. Another one is that it increases uterus cancer risk in postmenopausal women. Raloxifene, which is a weaker form of tamoxifen, has a lower risk of doing that. Uh, and it is equal in its uh, effect on invasive breast cancer, but uh, a little bit inferior in its effect on non-invasive breast cancer. Okay, so... Now, um, uh, now we're going to get real specific really quick so that we can get home. Um, uh, I'm not going to say too much more about surgery, uh, the early treatment of breast cancer, except the mastectomy and lumpectomy have equal survival outcomes, providing a patient is a good candidate for the lumpectomy. Uh, radiation therapy is used for local control to help save the breast, or if a woman has a lot of positive lymph nodes, also improve her survival by treating the, uh, the most contaminated area. And adjuvant systemic therapy improves survival, uh, and who needs adjuvant systemic therapy? In the absence of clear evidence of cancer to treat microscopic disease uh, depends on what her risk is, and we have some sophisticated ways to assess that that I won't go into. Uh, and the systemic treatment options are hormonal therapies. That makes perfect sense. Uh, 
chemotherapy, especially for women where hormones aren't an option or where risk is particularly high. And um, the whole thing is based on our assessment of risk in the patients. Now, uh, until uh, just uh, over 100 years ago, uh, oncology was dependent on one of the giants of medical history, which was a, a pathologist named Ver Verkow, who uh, was an incredibly uh, prolific and gifted man, but among the many things he did was he contributed to, to oncology two uh, organizing principles. The first one was that he said the basic unit of cancer is the cell. It's not the lump, it's the cell. And that seems obvious now, but that was a, uh, a big breakthrough and oncology couldn't go any farther until somebody had that simple fact figured out. The second thing he did was he studied lots of, of human cancer uh, slides and and he wrote a long book called The Tumorous Diseases uh, in German. While we were fighting our civil war, he was writing this book. And in this book, he marshals the evidence for what was ultimately his conclusion, which is that uh, cancers are, should be organized as diseases based on the place they arose. And if you think about it, that also isn't necessarily intuitively obvious. We still have confusion with this in some patients today. A, a woman uh, who has breast cancer in her liver doesn't have liver cancer. She has breast cancer in her liver. The biology is still breast cancer. Verkow figured it out by looking at it under a microscope, not really knowing too much more about the biology. And that was a very important uh, uh, point to recognize, and without that, we couldn't have made uh, any progress. Now, the, I'm going to spend the rest of the night bashing Verkow because we've exhausted his paradigm, and we still have people uh, in some institutions around this country who don't want to give up the Verkow, uh, the Verkow paradigm, and, and we, we need to. Now, if you just look at breast cancers under the microscope, there are several kinds of breast cancer, but there are only two we need to worry about. Infiltrating ductal breast cancer, by far the most common breast cancer, and the one we've been talking about all night, and lobular breast cancer, which is a very close cousin that uh, tends to be even more estrogen-driven than infiltrating ductal cancer, uh, and has some other features. It's harder to see on mammograms, et cetera. But this was what Verkow was able to, would be able to divide breast cancers into. And once you do that, you just say, okay, it's all one disease, Verkow said so, and they should all be treated the same. And most of our literature, uh, until the last 10 or 15 years, has been everybody in the pool literature where all patients with breast cancer were considered to have the same disease and dumped into the same clinical trials and treated the same. And around the 1980s or 1990s, uh, we stopped making progress with this paradigm. We were loading increasingly large numbers of patients into our clinical trials because we were looking for very tiny differences with different treatments because we we may have had treatments that were incredibly effective for 15% of the patients, but we had 85% of the patients that the difference didn't matter loaded into the clinical trial because we didn't understand that these infiltrating ductal cancers actually ha house four different diseases, actually probably six different diseases. So here's the new technology. Verkow had a microscope. We now have genomics. You can very quickly now take an individual breast cancer, and each one of these tiny columns is a different breast cancer sample, and uh, run a array, and then run it against a whole bunch of genes. Now the, you can get up to, to you can get thousands of genes now on one of these chips, and when you do that, uh, you find out that it, all breast cancers appear to not be the same at a genetic level, 
Um, red means that that particular gene is, is, has a high level of expression in that tumor, and green means it's low, and brown means it's average. And this, you look at this, the computer here has taken all these fingerprints of all these tumors and organized the, uh, the tumors by those that look alike. So these, these all here look a lot like each other and look totally different than these, which look like each other, which look very different than these, which look like each other, etc. And these computers routinely now come back and say, you, you really should be thinking about this as, as several different diseases. Uh, luminal A, this is the highly estrogen and progesterone receptor positive, a very com most common kind of breast cancer. Luminal B, uh, also uh, often estrogen receptor positive, but not as much. Uh, um, HER2 positive, shown here uh, as HERB2B. And then basal-like breast cancer, which actually has two diseases mixed in, mixed in it um, that appears to be arising from a different cell in the, in the breast duct, in the base of it. And before, this, 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 these were samples that were pulled out of, the, uh, out of the, the storage that were from a time before women got any systemic treatment for their breast cancer and if you look at this, there are major differences in the biology of these cancers left untreated. We had been treating them all as though they were the same, and uh, this cartoon uh, sort of lampoons that. Verkow would say this is all one disease, but we can put a finer point on it finally 120 years later. Not his fault. I mean, you know, everybody has their time. So... Uh, we haven't gotten yet, we haven't fully digested this, we haven't gotten to the point where we treat this one different than this one. Uh, we do treat this one different, uh, and were before this work was done, that it had been stumbled on by accident by Dennis Lehman here at UCLA that this should be treated differently, and that was already well underway. Um, uh, the basal breast cancers, we, we haven't developed a very good specific approach to them. So for right now today, we can improve a little bit on Vercal. We divide breast cancer into three groups, the estrogen receptor positive, HER2 new negative uh, breast cancers, which are still the majority of them, the HER2 amplified breast cancers, and I'll talk about these two mainly because this is where most of the news is, and then the so-called triple negatives. It's never a good sign when a disease is defined by what it isn't. That's a sign of, of ignorance on the part of the labeler, and, and we're, we're, we are ignorant when it comes to, uh, to this disease. It's uh, the battle with ER-positive breast cancer is not over. Um, these are the mortality rates in the United States for the two kinds of cancer, hormone-positive and hormone-negative, there will still be more deaths this year from hormone-positive breast cancer than hormone-negative breast cancer because hormone-positive breast cancer is so common. I just showed you that. Okay, so um, if, we're, if, if we're talking about which disease kills more people, it's still more estrogen receptor positives killing people, but that's because it's a more common disease. On a case-by-case -case basis, it's easier to manage these, these patients, and we all agree with that. Okay, now I'm just going to go through uh, systemic therapies, and I'm going to start with ER-positive breast cancer. So, because it's the most common, and it's actually the best understood. Um, this whole story starts in uh, the 19th century when uh, a Scottish surgeon... Uh, uh, um, found out that the farmers in Scotland were, uh, had noticed that if they took the ovaries out of cows, they would stop making milk. So the surgeon said, well, that's interesting. That means the ovaries must have something to do with the breast. Let's go take ovaries out of some women with breast cancer. And you couldn't do something like this today, make a leap like this. But that's what he did. He went, to, he went back to his office and he found three women with breast cancer. They didn't have any testing for estrogen receptor in those days. They didn't even know it existed. 
and he took ovaries out of three of them, and uh, um, uh, all three of them got better. And that, that became uh, a, a common treatment for breast cancer. Once larger amounts accumulated, they found that only about two-thirds of the patients were responding. But remember, that's not a shock. Only about two-thirds of the patients have, have that kind of breast cancer. They just didn't, didn't know that. Um, when my grandmother got breast cancer in the 1950s, uh, they took her pituitary gland out. And so this was still, uh, uh, you know, there was some controversy about whether it would be better to do ovaries or pituitary glands, but, but they were still doing endocrine surgeries without fully understanding uh, what was going on. Estrogen was discovered in, in 1920, and the estrogen receptor really wasn't described until the 1960s. So this isn't really a, 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 very, uh, a very old field. Uh, there are a bunch of ways to intervene here. You can uh, uh, give tamoxifen, which is an inferior form of estrogen. Some cells in your body, like bones and uterus, can still get an estrogenic response to it, but breast cells don't. And so if you have a lot of tamoxifen around, the, it, it impairs the ability of any estrogen around to, to exert an, an, a hormone effect on the breast. So tamoxifen increases bone strength while uh, treating breast cancer. It increases uterus cancer risk a little bit because it's an estrogen. Uh, the aromatase inhibitors don't do anything to stop the ovaries from making estrogen, but if you give them to somebody whose ovaries have stopped making estrogen, they will stop estrogen production in body fat and the adrenal glands and further reduce estrogen levels, and they will also work to decrease the amount of support that a cancer that a cell is getting. By the way, remember at the beginning when I said that cancer isn't the development of some new thing, it's a hijacking of an old thing. Uh, here, uh, these estrogen receptors are normal receptors, they've just been hijacked. They shouldn't be there. And uh, the estrogen is a normal hormone, it's just in this instance doing a bad thing. So that, that is consistent with the sort of paradigm we set up at the beginning. There's other hormonal therapies. Uh, Fazlodex or fulvestrant uh, 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 renders the receptor for estrogen uh, uh, incognate, so it can't uh, interact with estrogen at all. Uh, male hormone can work. Uh, Reason still not totally clear. Uh, progesterone can shrink breast cancer, and uh, this will blow your minds, and it's not fully understood but extremely high doses of estrogen can shrink breast cancer. That doesn't fit into any model I told you. Uh, we could talk about it later. All right. Um, so uh, here's the data for uh, using hormonal therapy after a woman has surgery for breast cancer to see if you can prevent the cancer from coming back spread around her body. Another way to, to say is this is using the tamoxifen to treat microscopic disease that we can't see on an x-ray and would just as soon never be able to see on an x-ray. And uh, tamoxifen, the chance of the women in these trials that are being summarized here um, uh, having a relapse is much reduced with tamoxifen compared to control. And the same thing is true of her chance of dying of breast cancer. Tamoxifen is a very old drug and one of the most successful drugs in oncology history in terms of what it's done, what it's done for people. Okay. Um, now, one of the developments in the last five years or so has been the recognition that 10 years of tamoxifen may be better than five and the extra side effects in terms of pulmonary embolism uh, killing people, blood clots, and development of, of uterine cancer is offset by its prevention of breast cancer deaths. There's a, a, about an 11% uh, difference in favor of, of 
of the 10 years versus versus five year uh, approach when we're comparing uh, those two those those risks to those benefits. In the 1990s, that's how recent it is. These aromatase inhibitors. There were three of them. They're all off patent now, so their brand names are are are, are not used as much. <clears throat> but uh, these three drugs all uh, work the same. They all stop the aromatase enzyme from producing estrogen in postmenopausal women. Uh, it, it's it's a good treatment for those women. Is an alternative to tamoxifen. In when you compare it head to head with tamoxifen, in every study where this has been done, the aromatase inhibitors uh, do a better job of preventing recurrence, but they don't change survival compared to tamoxifen, probably because they don't, uh, pre they don't cure more people, they just delay relapses in a few patients that otherwise uh, would have relapsed earlier. The current standard for these is five years, although some doctors use them for 10 when they're worried, and that, that makes sense. Okay, so here's what we know. If a, if a breast cancer expresses estrogen receptors, it's, it is still a driving force. It's a driving force in the development of breast cancer, even if it's ER negative, but otherwise men would get just as much triple negative breast cancer as women. But it's still a driving factor in the cancer you have to treat if you can still find estrogen receptors on it. These hormonally targeted therapies save lives, uh, tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors, and then we have other drugs we use in the treatment of metastatic disease as well. So this is, uh, there's, it, um, it's hard to figure a more uh, successful pathway in all of oncology than this whole estrogen story in, in breast cancer. Now I also, then you would say, well, wait a minute, you just told us that it's still a common cause of cancer death, uh, and now you're showing us that, that you've got this wired. The problem is that if a woman has metastatic breast cancer, that data was to prevent metastatic cancer, once a woman has it, we have many hormonal therapies, but at each stage, uh, if the first one works, the second one might work. If that one worked, the third one, third one might work. But at every stage, these women are developing resistance to estrogen uh, therapy. They're not them, but they're tumors. And the, the solution to this problem is the big thing for breast oncology. If you were gonna pick one thing that you, you'd, you'd ask Santa Claus for, you'd say, bring me something that stops the development of resistance to hormonal therapy. And so there's a lot of efforts to understand this, and cancer is really smart, uh, but we're getting smarter and it's not. And so over time, we're, we're gaining. So these are, pat these are growth pathways in cancer cells. Here's the simple model. Estrogen hitting the estrogen receptor goes to the nucleus and activates the estrogen response element, and uh, all these other features, growth and, and uh, uh, and uh, invasion on the part of these malignant cells starts to take place. If we cut off this fix, one of the, uh, there are several pathways that uh, may be uh, activating the, uh, the estrogen response element independent of estrogen. And here in this pathway, it doesn't matter what these numbers stand for, what these letters stand for, mTOR, the mammalian target of rapamycin, is what that particular thing stands for. This uh, we have inhibitors for, and once this was recognized, that this was one of the escape mechanisms, the approach was obvious, and that was a success that happened a few years back, and I'll show you that data. And now another pathway, the MAC kinase pathway, the growth uh, 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 cell cycle stimulating growth, has now been solved, and that was the big news a couple weeks ago. So here's a, uh, a trial called the Bolero 2. This was a randomized trial of uh, an aromatase inhibitor. Uh, these were women with, who had um, uh, uh, metastatic breast cancer, and 
they were randomly assigned to receive a, uh, and they had failed one aromatase inhibitor, they were randomly assigned to receive a different aromatase inhibitor that some people think might work when these fail, and the mTOR inhibitor plus this. Uh, so this is, this is, the theory is that the reason these women progressed is that they no longer need the estrogen pathway, They're, they want that mTOR pathway. So this was a randomized trial. Everolimus is also known as a Finitor. Some of you may know it by that name. And it has, it's a challenging drug. It can cause mouth sores and, and some other side effects that uh, for some women uh, make it challenging to take. But here was the difference in their probability of progressing. Uh, it wasn't subtle. When you see a hazard ratio like this, this means that at any given point in time, a woman receiving the Everolimus had one-third the risk that a woman rece not receiving Everolimus had of having had progression. You don't see those kind of numbers very often. In oncology, we get excited when these numbers are 0 0.7. This, this 0 0.36 was a big deal. Um, and, and, and it remains a, remains a big deal. Now, the news a couple weeks ago was that the FDA approved uh, a drug called pal palociclib um, for, or also known as Embrace, uh, uh, for the treatment of women with ER-positive breast cancer who had had progression after the Affinitor trick had been played. Now, why did they do that, and what is this? So that merits a little bit of, of, of time. So this is the cell cycle. The regulation of cell division is centered around the cell cycle. The cells go through a phase when they're getting uh, their they're either resting or growing, and then they enter a phase where they're getting ready to divide, so they're making a new copy of the chromosome so they can make two cells out of one. Then they stop for a, a little while, then they divide, and then the whole process starts again. And these cells don't have to continue to cycle. They can move here and take a nap and just stop dividing. And a lot of cells do that, and that's good, and that's when things are working. The regulation of this cell cycle is incredibly complicated, uh, but it is in part built around uh, a protein called RB. It's called RB because it, it, it is a tumor suppressor gene, and one of the things that happens when children lack this gene is they develop retinoblastoma. And the discovery wasn't, they were trying to figure out, they had this protein, what does it do? They had these kids with retinoblastoma and they were asking why. And it turned out that they uh, uh, had a, either a loss of or dysfunction of this RB gene. And the RB gene, um, uh, when it is, uh, uh, w w when it's active, it acts to shut down the cell cycle and it stops it right here at the R point. And the way the cell regulates largely whether your, your cells are cycling or not, especially in, in breast cancer cells, is whether it, the, it has phosphate on this RB or it doesn't. The, the more um, uh, phosphorylated it is, the more it stops working and lets this gate open and lets these cells start dividing. So a normal cell, behaving normally, following the rule book, who, that had a mutation that it was going to repair would say, okay, we divided, we made a mistake, we know we made a mistake, shut down, lock the gate, and either kill yourself if you can't fix it, and cells do that, they commit suicide. If it's called apoptosis, and if they're damaged and can't repair it, they kill themselves, and if they can't kill themselves, they raise their hand, and the immune system kills them. So that's why I made it to the age I am, instead of being like a mouse. So uh, um, that that works pretty well. Uh, if if uh, this RB is 
hyperphosphorylated in this cancer cell, then it loses its ability to stop this thing from continuing to divide and accumulating mutations. So uh, there's a, a way to, uh, to lock this gate uh, more permanently by blocking the, the factors that hyperphosphorylate the RB, the things that open the gate. You can, you can uh, lock the gate if you have something that can inhibit the gate opener. And this drug, there are several of them out there now, uh, 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 several big companies have one. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the one that was just approved that made all the news was palbociclib, and it's an inhibitor of CDK4-6. And this is how it works. It is a, it's a gate locker. Now that's a, that's a drug that, uh, it, that the company that owned it didn't think it was a very, a very powerful drug for much. They had tried it in lymphoma and things, and they weren't very enthusiastic about it. Uh, some people here at UCLA studied it in breast cancer, and they were acting on the assumption that this would be a triple negative breast cancer drug because it's a gate locker, so it really should get after cells that are fast growing but they put it through a test with a bunch of different breast cancer cell lines, and it wasn't the triple negatives shown here that were sensitive. The lower the bar, the more this, the cancer was killed by this compound. The, the ER positives were incredibly sensitive to this drug, which was a shock. It shows you you actually have to do the experiments because you can't figure it out ahead of time of what the experiments are going to show. So a randomized trial got done. You don't need to worry about part two. Uh, it d wasn't contributory. It was a randomized trial in women who had hormone receptor positive uh, metastatic breast cancer. It was randomized to get an aromatase inhibitor, the Femara or letrozole, or the combination of these two drugs. Unlike uh, uh, the Everolimus, palbociclib is is relatively non-toxic and, and doesn't have all the side effects that, uh, that Affinitor has. Uh, it does cause some low blood counts. Here were the separation of those two curves. And this was not a phase three trial. The FDA in general would say, okay, this is your proof of concept, do a big phase three. This company was in the midst of doing their big phase three when the FDA looked at this data and said, we're gonna approve it before you even have your phase three done because of this. So now we have two. Uh, we're getting smarter. We have two drugs for dealing with hormone escape. We're not done. The patients eventually will escape this as well. This curve comes down. This isn't a true part of the curve, but it will eventually come all the way down. Um, but but uh, now we have two reversers of hormone therapy resistance in these ER-positive breast cancers. Okay, um, this is the phase three that's done now, just the data aren't out, but it doesn't matter because the drug got approved based on, based on the phase two. I think we all know that the phase three is gonna be positive. So now I'm gonna move on to HER2 and, we'll be, and then we'll do triple negative pretty quickly. HER2 uh, positive breast cancer is another example of this thing that cancer is not this unique thing. It's a, it's a, uh, it's, it's a perversion of normal stuff. HER2 is a gene that we all have. Everybody has HER2, every woman, every man. We all have HER2. And in breast cells, it is expressed on breast cells. But in the normal breast cell, and in most breast cancers, it ex it's expressed at a normal level. Uh, in the 1980s, it was observed, before this was called HER2, it was called c herb 2 b at the time, because it was a, uh, it'd been initially identified in a rat uh, uh, neuroblastoma, um, that in breast cancer, some breast cancers have overexpressed HER2. They have a lot of HER2 uh, on its surface. This HER2 is an antenna that sits on the surface of the cell and receives signals. And when it's 
signaling it tells the cell, do not die and divide. And so it's a constant stimulus to the cell. Um, the first thing when it was, uh, does it look like this overexpression has anything to do with the biology of breast cancer? And those that weren't amplified in bre breast cancers had a much better prognosis than those that were amplified, uh, more than double. Uh, so that meant it, it, it's not just a, a passenger observation, it, it has some, it, it is really something. Uh, time goes by and it becomes clear that HER2 is actually a member of a family that has four members and this is a family of antennas where the antenna only works if two antennas are next to each other at just the right distance they can uh, receive input from a ligand and start to transduce their signal. Shown here is a homodimer, two HER2s uh, dimerizing, but HER2 can dimerize with HER3 and EGFR as well and, 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 and transduce a signal. That's going to become important later. You can develop an antibody, and Herceptin was that antibody that makes it impossible for the HER2 or makes it harder for the HER2 to form these dimers. And when that was done, Herceptin plus chemotherapy for metastatic breast cancer turned out to be much better than chemotherapy alone, and the FDA rapidly approved this drug, but nobody was cured. You know, having an increase in your time to progression and an increase in your median survival that's modest is something, it's a signal, but it's not, it's not a destination. This isn't where we want to stop. And so... Uh, uh, obviously, everybody was interested in moving this earlier and doing it to prevent the development of metastases in, in HER2 amplified breast cancer. Okay, this is the, the, the curves. Uh, really, what the Herceptin appeared to do was to make the prognosis of HER2 positive breast cancer as good as the prognosis of or is less bad as the prognosis for HER2 negative breast cancer. But none of these curves are curves we want to stop at. We want to, we want to take the signal forward. And now there have been several trials published, randomized trials published, of uh, use of this in HER2 amplified breast cancer in the adjuvant setting to prevent recurrence. And all of these trials are extremely positive uh, here's those real low numbers again. Um, this is now comparing aggressive chemo to aggressive chemo plus Herceptin. A woman's, this is again, we get excited about 0.75, this is 0.48. Okay? Um, and and uh, nobody in this day and age thinks that uh, Herceptin should ever be left out uh, except in some very extreme circumstances of the treatment of a HER2-positive breast cancer post-surgically. And now you're starting to look at curves and say, okay, that's a curve that, that could be a destination. That, that's something I could walk away and say, okay, we, we, did, we did good. Um, uh, chemo plus Herceptin is now working so well that it's going to be hard to show that something improves on it. Although something does improve on it, and I'll show you, okay? Now, um, resistance to Herceptin is a problem. It's a bigger problem in metastatic disease than it is in early breast cancer, as I showed you, but it's still a problem. And now here's one of the approaches to solving this problem, uh, and then the, I'll show you another. So here's these uh, three receptors, now actually cartoons looking more like the real protein looks. And here's what, here's the HER3 story. So HER3 receives its ligand stimulus, and what that causes it to do is to change and change its conformation so that now it dimerizes with uh, a HER2, uh, and now you can get a signal. There's, uh, and, and that signal is grow, and this is suicide. You do down arrow means it stops suicide. 
up arrow means it increases proliferation in angiogenesis. And uh, it also is involved with the, the regulation of that cell cycle we talked about. There's another antibody that doesn't block at, at the same place trastuzumab blocks, but what it blocks is the ability of HER3 to dimerize with HER2, and it turns out this heterodimerization is, uh, uh, is uh, common, and pertuzumab plus Herceptin has theoretical advantages over Herceptin alone. Now, uh, uh, um, this is the, the Cleopatra trial in metastatic breast cancer, uh, metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer, so they're getting chemotherapy, that's what docetaxel is, and they're either getting Herceptin alone or the combination of antibodies and these are the two combination groups. These are the two other groups. A big improvement in metastatic breast cancer. Okay? Um, and it also improved overall survival. Now, we're getting to the point where it's hard to get enough women into clinical trials and then follow them long enough to make rapid advances. And one of the things that the FDA has been very good about is they've been open to looking at uh, studies that uh, take women who have breast cancer but haven't had surgery. And instead of getting surgery then their chemo, they get chemo before their surgery. And that gives you a chance to look at how effective the chemotherapy was. And it turns out that if there's a full pathologic complete response patients do much better, uh, and that's been known for a long time. There was a lot of skepticism that the FDA would accept that, that meant it was better, but it's a way to do adjuvant trials with fewer women uh, and, and get quicker answers. So here was one neoadjuvant trial in HER2-positive breast cancer. The women either got taxotere herceptin Taxotere Herceptin with the pertuzumab, Herceptin with pertuzumab, or Taxotere with pertuzumab. Clearly, chemo plus Herceptin plus uh, 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 pertuzumab had the best pathologic complete response rate. Uh, that uh, it was also seen in other trials, and a couple years back, the FDA looked at this data and approved pertuzumab as long as the woman is getting neoadjuvant chemotherapy, the standard has become uh, this combination of chemotherapy with Herceptin and pertuzumab. And most of these women, when we treat them, at surgery they can't find any tumor. Okay, so now we are getting close to done with the treatment of, of, of HER2 positive breast cancer because if if we only have a, a couple of percent of women ever relapsing, we're not going to have a metastatic disease population to deal with, and that, that would not be a bad thing. A more important thing, something that's going to be applicable across oncology, is the development of drug conjugates. So there's a drug called TDM1, also known as, as uh, a Cadsila, that is Herceptin, but so an extremely powerful chemotherapy drug, too powerful to be safe if I just put it in somebody's vein, uh, can be linked to the Herceptin in a way that it won't come off outside the cell. That means that the chemotherapy will be delivered only to the cells that are overexpressing HER2. It gets enveloped into the cell, and in the cell, the cell digests the antibody and gets a mouthful of this incredible toxic poison and dies. Uh, uh, this is, uh, this, this is a, uh, something called an antibody drug conjugate, and most of us believe that this is going to be a big thing uh, in other diseases uh, uh, and in other parts of breast cancer. TDM1 works in, uh, uh, in HER2 positive but not HER2 negative cells, and it works in uh, breast cancer cells that are resistant to Herceptin. It doesn't care whether the cell is sensitive to Herceptin or not, it just cares if it has the receptor. It just says, get me there, and I'll 
and, and it'll eat me and I'll take it from there. It's sort of a Trojan horse uh, approach if you think about it. So um, there have been randomized trials of, of, uh, of trastuzumab versus, uh, with chemo versus TDM1 and not only was it more effective, it's less toxic. So now I just got done telling you that we're done with adjuvant therapy for HER2 positive cancer, and now here's, here's an opportunity. We still get hair loss, so now we can get greedy, right? We can, before we're dealing with death, and now we can start to talk about how do you make that TCHP that has such a high pathologic complete response rate that appeared like we could never improve on it efficacy-wise, how do you make that better? Well, you improve the toxicity. So there is a trial now, a neoadjuvant trial ongoing, looking at pure TDM1 versus TCHP. And uh, TDM1 doesn't cause hair loss or pretty much any of the other side effects of chemotherapy because of this Trojan horse deal. If that shows their equivalent in pathologic complete response rate, then we will be getting close to done with HER2 positive breast cancer, undoing the uh, fallout of evolution, okay? Um, TDM1 is, is better than other approaches. We can skip that. Um, so that's a happy story. Now the, the, the challenge. Um, basal breast cancer, also known as triple negative breast cancer, is still kind of the bugaboo. It's defined by what it is not, which reflects our our lack of understanding and insight into its biology. Uh, it's more common in women who have BRCA mutations, and it's more common in African Americans. It used to be thought that all of the disparity in mortality rates from breast cancer comparing Caucasians to African Americans was due to disparities in health care. And it, it, there are disparities in health care, but it turns out that some of that is due to a more virulent kind of breast cancer. Uh, being more common in that population. Uh, there are two areas of promise, and then I'm done. I have, I think, two more slides. Uh, and those are the PARP inhibitors and the immune checkpoint inhibitors. The immune checkpoint inhibitors first. Again, one of the things that Weinberg and Hanahan, uh, uh, Hallahan uh, uh, talked about was evading immune destruction. One of the... Um, one of the, uh, the, the bugaboos for immunotherapy has been that even when a T cell has been uh, uh, smart enough to recognize that there's a tumor antigen and got itself all set up to go kill that cancer cell, and you, know, you can forget about this side, just look at this, the effector side for now. Um, when it gets to that cancer, when it gets to that cell, uh, the normal protective mechanisms kick in. So it is common, probably, for our T cells from time to time to take an ocean to kill something that's normal. That's where things like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and those kind of things may come from. Uh, we have good, that doesn't happen often because we have good defenses, and the defense has to do with a dialogue that takes place. So uh, the, um, the, the T cell has a receptor on it that's looking for a certain antigen, and it finds it. So now it's hooked up, and now it knows it's hooked up to a cell, and this cell is perfectly capable of killing this cell, and it's primed to do that but it does one last thing. It interrogates that cell. It says, are you self? And it sets out a receptor. And that receptor uh, uh, is looking for a ligand. So this is called PD-1, and this is called PD-L1, or the ligand for PD-1. And if it, if it gets this, if the cell knows the password, it backs off. Because normal cells have PDL1. Well, tumor cells can hijack this. Tumor cells can have PDL1 and defeat this. And so uh, there are antibodies that 
can be developed that won't let PDL1 attach with PD. So it looks to the T cell like the tumor cell doesn't know the password, it is an invader, and it kills it. This has been a big revolution, made all the news in melanoma. These drugs are on the market now uh, for melanoma, and just last week, uh, they were one of them was approved for lung cancer. And there is some evidence that this is going to play a role in triple negative breast cancer. So that's one ray of, of, of sunshine. The other has to do with these PARP inhibitors and uh, 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 and uh, here's sort of the story with that. There's a second kind of DNA damage. I told you about double-stranded DNA damage. Most DNA damage is single-stranded breaks, SSBs. And uh, the SSBs get repaired by PARP. Um, if they uh, don't get repaired by PARP, then um, uh, they become double-stranded breaks and the last chance to repair them is BRCA, uh, which is deficient in BRCA mutant uh, cancers. BRCA is also uh, uh, um, appears to be deficient in, in triple negative breast cancers, at least some of them. They, they call it brackenness because they look like they have a BRCA mutation. And these are, are chromosomes from uh, a non-BRCA uh, breast cancer that uh, was exposed to DNA damage and a PARP inhibitor. And here's the BRCA ones that were exposed to a PARP inhibitor and DNA damage. The, the, the chromosomes are a mess because there's no DNA repair left. You've knocked out both the single strand and the double strand kind of DNA repair. It, this was a big deal in triple negative breast cancer a few years ago, and then the clinical trial was negative, but it turned out the PARP inhibitor was not a good one. And so now we have to go back and, and redo that correctly. So um, I think we've covered everything pretty well, and I'll stop there and take questions if anybody's still awake. Okay. So do you want to call people in or you go ahead? Yeah. You first and then I'll do her. Oh, okay. Um, I saw a show on television and it had to do with using simple viruses. Vice. It was it was on it was on Vice, yes. yes. Yeah. And No, and, I, and I, I'm not sure they're going to be approved in 2016. I think that, it, that there's a public service to information, and then there's a disservice by not going around to 50 different centers to sort of get an idea of all the exciting things that are going on. You know, um, uh, somebody like Sanjay Gupta can talk to one person, get all excited, and and make it seem like he scoured the nation and critically reviewed everything, and this was the best thing, as opposed to just the guy he ran into. Uh, that's my, my beef with that. That's all very, very good work. There are lots of very exciting things going on around the country, and, and that vice thing has done the disservice, that it makes it look like the virus is, is going to be the way forward. I think that if we... If I could fast forward to uh, 100 years from now, um, my prediction would be that that will have contributed a small percent to what we'll be doing and that there'll be, we won't be doing much of what we're doing now, but a lot of the other things will, will have made bigger impacts. There isn't anything like that in breast cancer, so you were next, yeah. 
I know. I think the one behind you was, and then you, and then you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, there, there's, there's a lot of that going on. The, the, so what she's saying is, why don't we just, when we're giving chemotherapy for metastatic breast cancer, why don't we keep sampling the tumor and looking at the genetic changes that are taking place? And because um, uh, she, she doesn't understand why that wouldn't take place. I wouldn't understand it either, but it is taking place. Uh, it's not done at a clinical level because it hasn't, it's not ready for prime time. So what those data tell us is that tumors change a great deal. In fact, they, they have evolutionary trees that look like what Darwin drew for, for tortoises, and, and they're responding to the pressure of the chemotherapy. The problem is that um, if you do that, in, instead of the first 50,000 mutations, most of which are background noise and need to be ignored, uh, but nobody has a way of picking which ones should be ignored, have become 62,000 mutations, and you don't know if one of those is, is the important one, and if it is, the odds are you won't have something to target it. So most of the abnormalities that are found aren't actionable. We, there's not something we can do to make it different. But we're accumulating a ton of information there. Uh, the other issue has been, uh, it's been very difficult to, um, to it, it, there are logistical challenges to repeatedly sampling tumors, right, and getting genomic data. You have to get a big piece for genomic data, and that would mean, uh, sticking needles in every single metastasis, big needles, every time you wanted to make a therapeutic change, waiting two weeks and then getting back a stack of papers this thick and not knowing which of the pages. It's like trying to drink from a fire hydrant. It's what it's been described as. And that's, that's, that's been the challenge. That challenge is partly overcome by now we can, uh, we think uh, we can, get the tumor cells out of the bloodstream, and so we skip the need for a biopsy, or it turns out the tumor cells are shedding DNA, and we can get their genes out of the blood without getting tumor cells out of the blood. So you're gonna see more and more of this, but the glib notion that all we have to do is biopsy and we'll know what to do, and we'll have it in our, in our, in our haversack is, uh, is, is glib and it's not, it's not a reality yet. The other problem has been the ability to analyze these things. The, the software you need to make sense of that, and it may be that genomics isn't enough. You may need protonomics, right? And so, and, and then that just raises the complexity by a power of a thousand. So, so that's, the, that's the issue, but you're right. We should be, uh, uh, figuring out what's going on, but it's going to need more than just saying I'm switching from adriamycin chemo to cytoxane chemo. It's going to mean finding mutations that we have that we know are drivers, and we can prove it's a driver for that cancer, and having an action we can take. Most, you know, in pancreas cancer, we know what drives pancreas cancer. We've known it for 25 years. We, it's one gene. If there, there's one gene. And if we could just do something about that, it's called RAS. And the entire world has been trying to develop a strategy to deal with it. And then so far, it, so you can stick needles in those till the cows come home. It'll tell you, yeah, I'm RAS. What are you going to do about it? Right? I mean, so those are some of the issues. I'm sorry, I cut you off, so. No, because the end of all causes is pretty much the same. It's a, it's a, it, it's a 
it's a it's built on a foundation of accumulated mutations, and whether they were mutations that happened uh, because of some exposure, or mutations that happened because of the natural accumulation of mutations, which we're all doing, we've all done it while we've been sitting here. Um, uh, there isn't a way to know. And in retrospect, it probably doesn't matter. It's, it's what happened was you, you got, you found out the, at a real gut level, this whole Darwinian thing, you know, that, that, that bad things can happen because we can't put all of our energy into defending one part of it. We have to ration it. And there's, there's, collateral damage. There are people who get their cancer younger. Yeah. Yes. So the, the problem with the Trojan horse is, well, first of all, let's just talk about HER2 and ER. When a tumor cell expresses ER, you should assume it's the driver unless it's HER2 new amplified. Then it's not going to be the driver. The driver's the HER2. And we've had trouble showing any benefit from hormonal therapy with the HER2 positives, but we may not need it because we're getting so good at dealing with the HER2. But you, what you're really asking is, why not just make a Trojan horse, get an antibody that interacts with the estrogen receptor, and, and hook a horrible chemotherapy to it and just give it to people. The problem is uh, HER2 behaves itself by only being overexpressed in tumor cells. Estrogen receptor gets expressed in lots of tissues. And so that's one of the one of the limits of Trojan horses is you got to have Troy with only one gate, uh, or you can hurt people. So that's one of the been one of the challenges to drug conjugates. Yeah. Huh. I didn't do it, so. Yeah. Um, and also, I just want to know, because you talked so much about the environment, the estrogen positive, but about the question of the estrogen positive. Hurt you negative, you mean? Hurt you negative. No. For hurt you positive? Yeah. The, yeah, every, it, it, every, everything applies. Everything applies that I talked about. Um, Women, men don't get HER2 positive breast cancer very much. There's a clue there, right? It, it, it's, I gotta figure out a better way to say this, but I haven't been able to. Women get breast cancer, all kinds of breast cancer, including triple negative and HER2 positive, for the same reason they get breasts. And men get prostate cancer for the same reason they get prostates. This is part of, that's what I, I spent a little time at the beginning trying to, because we have this notion before Varmus and Bishop told us it's our own genes, it's not some external force, um, uh, we have this notion that this is some external invader, and if we can only get back to the Garden of Eden, breast cancer won't happen. And prostate cancer won't happen. Um, we, we can hope to level the playing field so the people who get cancer young still get to live into their 80s when everything falls apart at once, you know, and, and, and when we've, we've kind of titrated ourselves well. Um, uh, but we can't, we can't say that there must be something bad that happened. It's sort of nature um, taking its toll. Clearly, the same number of mutations are going to cause more trouble if you inherited uh, a less good set of repair genes, right? Uh, 
cancer is going to be more likely to happen if you do things that cause more mutations. Um, and then you're more likely to get it. And I tried to show you that most of the lifestyle intervenable things are all final common pathways estrogen. And if you just keep estrogen in mind as, a, as, as how to organize these risk factors, it's estrogen that's bringing about the proliferation, and it's the proliferation that's setting up the substrate for mutations, whether you're BRCA positive or not. In BRCA positive women, um, tamoxifen lowers breast cancer risk. You know, if you just leave her alone, she has a 75% risk. If you give her tamoxifen, you can, you can lower that risk. Yeah, even though BRCA is a dominant factor, if you act to lower the proliferation, you, you achieve some benefit. But what if some ER negative, ER negative, compared to That your being ER negative means that your final end tumor is no longer driven by estrogen. It doesn't mean that it wouldn't, it, it would have happened if you had no estrogen, right? I mean, that those, the, the loss of estrogen receptor means you can't use estrogen to treat it. It doesn't mean it was estrogen that, it wasn't estrogen that caused it. And, and but just do the experiment. You know, do like Einstein, he used to do these mind experiments. If ER positive breast cancer, or negative breast cancer was not contributed to by estrogen, men would have just as much ER negative breast cancer as women. You, a man has just as many breast cells as a woman has. Yeah. Uh, about 25 years ago, my wife had uh, breast cancer. It was uh, ER negative. And about that time, the definitive study came out on tamoxifen, and there was a paragraph in there that really struck me. I remember it. Uh, and it had to do with some percentage of ER negative patients improved with tamoxifen, although the mechanism was not understood since tamoxifen was working against the estrogen. Uh, can you enlighten me? I can. So what that paper said was 5% of women who are ER negative respond to tamoxifen. And the problem is you think that it's a black and white issue, but the estrogen receptor and the definition of positive and negative is hugely complex. And in those days when all those papers were written, they were not measuring estrogen receptor like they do now with an immunoperoxidase stain. They were measuring it by grinding up the cancers and then measuring estrogen binding by the schmutz, by the, this protein soup that they produced. The problem with that was, one of, the, one of the many problems was that in many breast cancers, when you look at them under the microscope, if you have a big lump of breast cancer, there's a few breast cancer cells and a huge amount of connective tissue and stroma. This is especially true in lobular breast cancers. And um, uh, if you grind that up, you'll get relatively few estrogen receptors per gram of protein, which is how it was expressed. But if you express it as number of estrogen receptors per cancer cell, it would be astronomical. That's why these immunoperoxidase stains replaced that, that femtomoles per milligram of tissue protein approach. So those were probably patients who, uh, in a modern laboratory, would have been called ER positive. Yeah, it's a pro it's 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 a it's a new very new. Yeah. So Helga, yeah. Uh, regarding the vitamin factors, what do you think about the stress in our lifestyle? I don't I don't know, and I don't spend a lot of time worrying about it because and I'll tell you why. Um, because stress, first of all, you have to define something, right? So define stress. 
that's a problem. But if you define it as a state of mind that's uncomfortable for you, that you would prefer to avoid, why would anybody defend that? Yes, get all the stress out of your life, right? Even if it doesn't have anything to do with your cancer, why would you want it there? And the, the problem isn't that the, developing a consensus that people should get rid of their stress. The problem is it's a really hard thing to do. Who knows? And, and number one, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm against stress. I, 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 I think everybody is. Yeah. Usually the right thing to do is to see an oncologist at that point. They're kind of the ones that are trained to tell you what your risk is and then tell you what the relative uh, impacts on your breast cancer risk are with various interventions and what the side effects are because they treat a lot of patients. These are the, the this is gonna sound right, but um, if you're having a busy day, the, this is, that's the patient you don't want to show up, somebody who just wants to talk about prevention because it's a, a very long discussion when you do it right. And you need to sit and, and have the time to do it because it's, um, there are real benefits and there are real risks. One of the benefits is not that it'll save your life. These Estrogen modulating drugs lower your risk of getting breast cancer, but they don't lower your risk of dying of breast cancer. Another way of saying that is there's most breast cancers are curable. About two thirds of the women who develop breast cancer are cured, and about one third aren't. All of the prevention comes out of the two thirds. And I have no idea why God made the world this way, but, but, but the ones we most want to prevent aren't the ones that these drugs prevent. Yeah. So uh, in California now, you'll get a letter because there's a law that you have to get a letter uh, when you're, you have a dense breast re readout. Um, what that means is that you, your breasts are hard to interpret on a mammogram and that a, can a cancer would be easier to hide in your breast than in the average breast. And so what you do about that is either accept it as just the way things are. Mammograms are nice and important, but they only lower breast cancer mortality by 30% at most. That means that 70% of cancers that are gonna kill do what they need to do before they're visible on a mammogram, even if even under the best of circumstances. So the incremental loss to you is, is modest by having the dense breasts, or do MRIs, which have the problem that they see things that aren't there, but they see through this density. Those are, those are kind of your options. Yeah, so. Oh, we actually, she, she gets to repeat before you. <laughs> you you'll be next, yeah. So, yeah. Be, breast can well, that, that one I can't explain. Um, uh, I can glibly explain it, because that's how everybody does it. But on the androgen receptor thing, we didn't talk about it, but breast cancers often express androgen receptor if they express estrogen receptor. And that signal from the androgen receptor is an anti-proliferative signal in breast cancer. So once in a while, a male hormone becomes a real bailout. Not so much now that we have ixomestane and, and pablociclib, but it, it's on the list of things. Hi, why high dose estrogen would work? It only works if you've gotten the breast cancer cell resistant to estrogen therapies. And then 
you give high-dose estrogen, and the women get very sick. It's, you, you think estrogen is a good thing, but in high doses, it makes you sick. It makes you nauseated. Uh, it's, it, it can be rough as a treatment. And that's a change in milieu, and the cancer is all adapted to a zero-estrogen milieu, and, and the high-dose estrogen can work. It's never been a very practical treatment. It doesn't get used very much. It's highly toxic, and because it's sixth line, its chance of working is very small, but it can work. And there's a clue there that I don't fully understand. So, yeah. Can you talk about um, omega-6, possibly leading to the breast cell disability in omega-3? Uh-huh. Is the breast cell membrane more stable? Yes. You know, that's why people want to have breast cancer. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. Also, also, just to mention that is um, women that take tamoxifen because you can actually take it as pulmonary um, embolism with omega three also prevent that from getting sick. So, um, first of all, their risk is mainly of deep venous thrombosis. Pulmonary emboli are very uncommon. That's, that's first of all. But it, there is an antithrombotic effect of omega threes, but it's very weak. And I would, if I needed anticoagulation, I wouldn't do it with omega threes. This, the, your first question, um, do you recommend omega threes? We don't have good evidence that they lower the risk of breast cancer. We do have in vitro evidence and some in vivo evidence that they make cells less responsive to estrogen. So the estrogen signal in an omega six rich membrane is much stronger than in an omega-3 rich membrane. And it has to do with the prostaglandins that are formed and, and cyclic uh, uh, AMP. But um, this is like the stress answer. I don't think it matters if it lowers your risk of breast cancer. It's been shown to, to lower death rates from heart disease. So what, why is it, if it, if it's helpful for breast cancer, fine, since most women with breast cancer are going to die of strokes and heart attacks, just like all other women will. They ought to be guarding that part of the fort even more heavily than they are the breast cancer. Okay, so we're set. Thank you, Dr. Gillespie, for an incredible lecture. Um, uh, you all were applauding. Let's give him one more round of applause. I want to remind you all to please turn in your pink forms and your green sheet and your form to be on our mailing list before you leave. And I just want to remind you on April 21st, we're going to talk about prostate cancer. And on May 12th, we're going to be talking about advanced care planning. We hope to see you then. Have a great night. Drive safely.